If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn in the uh, book of 1 John. We're going to be looking this morning at 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through chapter 2 and verse 2. While you're turning there, uh, we want to welcome for uh, the very first time, Maeve Jensen has come to church, and uh, it's good to see the Jensen family here, uh, and uh, we rejoice. You can greet Maeve after the service uh, and uh, uh, say hello to her. Welcome our new covenant child. One of the most important questions that uh, we can ask ourselves uh, is the question of who is God? Uh, the, the answer to that question uh, really determines uh, our life, what we think, what we do, uh, because it's so foundational. Now, our, our shorter catechism uh, answered that question this way. God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, unchangeable uh, in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Um, and, but that's not a common answer. Uh, in America today? Uh, well, it's not common because it's, it's such a long answer, but it's also not common in concept uh, as well. Uh, if you talk to people, uh, people at work or friends or family, and you have a discussion about God, and you begin describing the God of Scripture, uh, you'll get red flags from them. No, 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 that's, that's not, no. My view of God, they say, and then they tell you what their imagination has come up with. Uh, or someone might say, uh, I think of God as, and then usually it's kind of a, a loving grandfather figure. Uh, you know, he's always around so you can go to him when you need something, but he doesn't bother you much uh, otherwise. And if you, if you blow it, he always forgives you. Uh, and th these, these ideas of God then determine how we live and what we do. Now, John is concerned uh, about uh, understanding who God is. And the problem of defining God wrongly is not anything new at all. Remember, in the Garden of Eden, it was Satan who came and accused God uh, of, of having a nature that was not his. Uh, he, uh, he de um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, he distorted the character of God in that situation. Since then, false teachers, uh, both ancient and today, have distorted the character of God to fit in with the picture of what they want God uh, to be like. So today we want to look at John's uh, description of God and then its implications is for us uh, as well as what salvation is is really about. Now, last time, we, uh, when we started last week, this series, uh, in verse 3, we saw that one of the reasons that John was writing this letter is because he wanted them to have fellowship with, with both himself and with the Father and with the Son. Now, this raises questions. If, if we, if we want to have fellowship with God, how do we do that? How do we have fellowship with the biblical God? The God of our imagination is easy to have fellowship with, but what about the God of Scripture? And that's what John lays out for us today in our text. What we are reading today, I remind you, is indeed the very Word of God. And so let us pay attention. I will read 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie, and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, 
we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the ministry of the Apostle John. We thank you for the work of your Spirit in uh, coming and giving to us through John this inspired letter. And we thank you for the revelation that it gives of you. We ask today that you would give to us a clarity and understanding, that you would work through your Spirit uh, to, uh, in our hearts to help us to respond in whatever way is most appropriate to what we hear. Give us faith to believe and give us faith to do. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So as we saw last week, the, the context, the historical context of what John is writing is that there was a doctrinal issue going on in the churches in Asia, which John was overseeing. This issue was the beginning of what in the second century became full-fledged Gnosticism. Uh, Gnostics uh, were a, a taught a philosophy that said that the flesh, material things, these are all evil. The spiritual things are good. This would be one reason why Gnostics would deny uh, that there was ever a bodily resurrection, because who wants to be raised in a new body that's evil by its very nature? They also taught that their view of salvation was something that was attainable only for a few and only through a secret knowledge that could be passed down to them. And so they were, uh, they were spiritual elitist. Uh, they had this false idea about uh, God's creation. Uh, the form that John is referring to is called docetism, uh, from a verb, Greek verb that means to seem. And they taught, the docetists taught, that Jesus appeared to be human, but he really wasn't. He was a ghost or a phantom uh, because, of course, uh, he couldn't be human uh, because he would never take on uh, a body that was evil uh, by its very nature. And, and so John has discovered this teaching has been going on. It's disrupted the churches. Later, we'll see there have been people that have left the church. They followed the heretics. Uh, and this disruption is quite serious uh, and has created significant problems within the congregation. And so he, he writes to them, and you'll notice he talks about this message in verse 5 uh, that he is sending to them. This is the message that was proclaimed by the apostles. He, he says, the apostles have a message that I am delivering to you. But the real authority of the message, notice in verse 5, is that this is something we have heard from him, a reference to Jesus. We, the message that we bring you is a message that we heard firsthand in person that Jesus gave to us. Now, the Gnostics, they had never met Jesus. They were full of speculation, but they had no firsthand knowledge of, of meeting Jesus, of hearing Jesus. Uh, and John wants them to understand, this is our authority. We're firsthand, as we saw last week, we touched Jesus, we heard Jesus, we saw Jesus, and the message that we bring you has come from him. This is why biblical Christians reject all of those Gnostic gospels that people keep bringing up. We reject them because they were written late, number one, they were not from the apostles, they're full of speculation and false doctrine. It's the apostolic tradition that we have in the Gospels and in the epistles that are the foundation of our faith. And John is making sure that the congregations he's writing to understand that important point uh, as well. And here is this message that they are proclaiming, the end of verse 5. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. John's making a statement about the essence, the being of God. God is light. 
Uh, John has uh, made such statements both in his gospel and later in 1 John about the nature of God. Uh, in John chapter 4, he says that God is spirit. Uh, he's a spirit essence. And later in 1 John 4, he'll say that God is love. Here, he says God is light. And each one of those has a, an important emphasis to it. Uh, here in, uh, in our text, to speak of God as light is a reference to his holiness and his purity. Uh, and he is, when we talk about God being holy, in the one hand, it, it can be referred to he is separate. Holy means set apart. He's separate from his creation in every way. Here, the contrast between light and darkness, John is making the point that God is pure. He is holy in that he is separate from all sin. And, and to make that point stronger, he says, there is no darkness in him at all. There's no taint of sin in any way because he is a holy, holy God. Now, this aspect of God's holiness comes up so many times in Scripture. There must be a significance to it. In, in 2 Chronicles, the, the singers at the temple are, are called to praise God for the beauty of of holiness. Uh, psalm 99 uh, is an entire psalm devoted to praising God because he is holy. Uh, the famous passage that we've looked at before in Isaiah 6, where Isaiah in this vision is taken into the throne room of God, uh, and he sees the glory of God on the throne, but what impresses him so much is the seraphim that are there surrounding the throne, continuing to sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And we see the same picture in Revelation 4, again in the throne room where, where God is praised, this time by cherubim, who continually sing of the holiness of God. This aspect of God's holiness is, is crucial to understanding who he is uh, as he presents himself in, in Scripture. Uh, there seems to be a priority of understanding the holiness of God and then its implications for other things. And so, for example, when we think about the love of God, uh, the love of God is a reflection of his holiness. God's love has been displayed in sending his son, Jesus Christ, to pay for the sins of sinners. This was required because God is holy and can't overlook sin and pretend that it didn't happen. The justice of God is a reflection of his holiness and his determination uh, to, to, uh, to see that rebellion and unrepentant sin is dealt with properly, or he wouldn't be a holy God. And so John picks up on this aspect of God being a holy God uh, and wants us to exalt God and praise him for his holiness. But this presents a problem. Verse 3, we're called to have fellowship with God and Jesus Christ. How can you and how can I have fellowship with a holy God, with a God that takes sin so seriously, with a God who is infinitely pure and set apart from sin. How can we hope to have fellowship with him? And before John gives us the answer to that, he presents to us the greater problem, and that's in verses 6 through 10, because he wants us to see how great sin is is a problem for each one of us. We have no reason to think we could have fellowship with the Holy God because our sin is so great. Now, he does this by quoting the false teachers. Notice in verse eight, uh, 6, 8, and 10, those verses begin with, if we say, he's quoting the heretics and then showing why their teaching is so false. And so he uses three arguments from the heretics uh, in order to refute uh, what they have been saying according to the gospel. Uh, and so the first one uh, is uh, there in verse 6, and this argument is, verses 6 and 7, I can be saved but live a life of sin. 
It says, if we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The word walk uh, is in a tense uh, of something that's ongoing. Uh, and, it, and it describes uh, how we live. It, it is the ongoing, habitual way of life. Everyone in this room is walking, either in light or in darkness. Our lives are characterized by either a relationship with God in which we're reflecting his holiness in our lives, or it's a life that is habitually apart from God and we are living in disobedience to his commandments. There is no middle ground. Uh, you're either walking in the light or you're walking in the darkness, is what John is saying here. Uh, and, and so he, he comes to, to make this point that you can't say, I belong to Jesus. I belong to the one who is the light, but I live my life in the darkness. I've, I, I live my life in habitual sin, but I know that I'm saved. And he says to them, those who say such things, uh, that we lie and do not practice the truth. We lie because we are saying something that God does not say. We are bearing witness to something that God says is false when we make that kind of statement. He's not describing, let's be clear about this, verse 6 is not describing sinlessness. To walk in the light is not to have a life in which we have no sin. That, that doesn't happen. But it's a life which is characterized by a love of God, a commitment to the Lord, and a life of general obedience. That's what it means to walk in the light. And so that is completely contrary to the one who says, I walk in, my life is characterized uh, by living in disobedience to God. Uh, now, examples of this uh, uh, over the, the history of the church, more recent history of the church, uh, are those people that say, for example, I prayed the sinner's prayer when I was eight years old, and I know everything is okay. It doesn't matter how I live now, because God says that once saved, always saved, and everything will be fine in the end. Or the, uh, the, the idea of a uh, horribly unbiblical idea of I'm a carnal Christian. I'm saved, but my life is characterized by sin. But it's okay. At some point, I'll, I'll come back to God and everything will be fine. These kind, uh, one, one other, I suppose, that I, I think of is in the last 20 years, there's this movement in the evangelical church Thankfully, it didn't grow a lot, but it was a movement that said, when you're saved, you, you believe in Jesus and you receive Jesus as your savior. It's only later in life that you may decide to receive him as Lord. And so he can be your savior, but he's not necessarily your Lord. These are the kinds of lies that send people to hell. These are the kinds of false assurances that are so dangerous, and this is the reason that John loves his congregation so much that he writes to warn them about these very things. Uh, and so uh, there's no fellowship with God. Remember, that's the context here. How do we fellowship with the holy God? You can't fellowship with the holy God if you're living in darkness and you're walking in darkness. The second quote that he gives there in verse 8 uh, is that, to summarize it, it's, I don't have a sin nature. He says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. The, the heretics were probably teaching one or two things, maybe both, uh, about this point. They may have been teaching that because of our special knowledge, we have a new nature. Uh, and sin uh, is not our nature any longer. Or they could have been teaching that because we have this special knowledge and because we're spirit rather than flesh, sin has no impact on us. 
because sin is what we do in the body, and we've been released from that kind of, of problem of, of sin. And so John writes to say, this is self-deception. Uh, he says, if you believe that you have no sin nature, you are deceiving yourselves, uh, in verse 8, and the truth is not in you. Uh, to believe that your standing, uh, to, to believe that your nature is not impacted by sin is a lie. It's a lie because Scripture says otherwise. Men, women, it come into a point of self-deception when they believe the lie. And they believe to think, I'm really doing well. I don't have a sin problem. Charles Spurgeon, one Sunday, uh, had some, uh, a gentleman come to the service and then went up to Spurgeon after the service and explained to Spurgeon that he didn't have a sin nature any longer. Uh, and Spurgeon was intrigued enough that he invited him to his home for lunch. Uh, and uh, they sat down to lunch, and Spurgeon gave him an opportunity to, to explain all of these things, how sin no longer was a problem for him because his nature had been taken away, the sin nature had been taken away. And Spurgeon then picked up his glass of water and threw it into the man's face. You can imagine the man was not happy. In fact, he became very, very angry at what Spurgeon had done. And Spurgeon says, ah, you see, your nature is not dead. It was only sleeping. And a glass of water has raised it up. <laughs> I do not advise you to do this with someone that you disagree with on doctrinal issues, or especially an unbeliever. But Spurgeon's point is, we can pretend for a while that our sin nature is completely under control or gone. But the reality is this is a nature that we continue to struggle with. We do have a new nature, but the old nature is not gone. And the struggle with sin will continue until God gives to us the fullness of our salvation at the very end of time. In order to have fellowship with God, you have to be willing to admit the sinful nature that you have, the nature that from it springs actual sin. And that's the point that he goes on to make in verse 10. Verse 10 is saying, I no longer sin. It says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. The Gnostics taught that because of their uh, enlightenment, because of their elevated spirituality, that sin was not something that they did any longer. They were freed from that problem. And, and we poor Christians that still sin, uh, you know, it just shows how far away we are from full enlightenment and, and full salvation. Uh, I, I've said this to, to some of you, a story of early in my, well, it wasn't early in my ministry. It was about uh, 15, 20 years ago. A couple came to me for marital counseling. Uh, and they came in and they sat down in my office and she started up and had a, a lengthy list of all the things her husband had done wrong and why he was the problem in the marriage. And so I listened to her, then I, I, I said to her, what have you done to contribute to the problems in your marriage? And she responded and said, nothing. I haven't sinned for a long time. Well, I sat up in my chair. I'd never met someone who'd never sinned, stopped sinning. Uh, and I said, really, is this true? And the husband at that point looked at me and said, now do you understand? <laughs> and I did. Counseling did not go well after that because I assured her that she was a sinner, that she committed sins every day. And the problem was her unwillingness to acknowledge it and to repent of them. And she became so angry at me, I should have pointed out that that was sinful, but I didn't. But she became so angry with me and stomped out of the office because I didn't recognize that she no longer struggled with sin. When we get to a point that we believe that we've overcome sin, whether it's Gnosticism or the equally dangerous doctrine of, of perfectionism, where we grow spiritually to a point where sin is no longer a problem, that we've overcome that problem. We know 
that our thinking is in darkness and not in the light because it's contrary to what God himself says about us. And it brings all kinds of other problems uh, in marriages and relationships with other people because I'm never wrong. So you must always be wrong. Uh, and the kind of horror that that brings into relationships. In verse 9, tucked between verse 8 and 10, John gives us the opposite of what these heretics have been, have been saying. He says, rather than denying your sin nature, rather than denying that you commit, uh, the, denying that you ever commit sin, the answer is you need to confess your sins. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To confess something means to agree with. When we come before God and we confess our sins, we are agreeing with God that what I have done is contrary to his word. When we confess our sins, we are making a commitment that we're going to see our sin as the holy God sees them and then agree with him on how grievous they really are. Now, when we confess our sins, there's two, two things that we need to keep in mind. First of all, we need to confess with some specificity. We, I remember as a boy that when I was praying uh, at, at night before I went to sleep, uh, I would pray, and God forgive us all our sins. And it was kind of this blanket uh, prayer. And that's not how mature Christians pray. We come before God remembering specific sins. Our, our confession says that we are to uh, repent of particular sins particularly. Now, in order to do this, it means we need to acknowledge those sins when we become aware of it. We don't save them up for several days because we'll forget uh, but we come before God when we uh, are become aware of our sin and we repent of that specific sin. More than that, we also need to not only confess, but we need to repent. Repentance, confession is part of repentance, but repentance also includes the sorrow because I've sinned against a holy God. How could I sin against a God who has loved me and given Christ for me? And by God's grace, it's a determination that I will turn away from that sin and will instead live in righteousness and holiness as God has called me to do. When we come to confess our sins in these ways, notice what the promise is. The promise is whenever we do this, God will forgive us. Whenever we're willing to acknowledge our sins and confess them, God is ready to forgive us and <clears throat> no matter what the sin is. How can we be sure of this though? How can we be sure that God would really, you, you think of the worst sin that you've committed and you think of the worst series of sins that you've committed. How could God forgive me for those? Notice verse nine. Because he is faithful. He always keeps his word. God always does what he said he will do, and he's promised to forgive you. There is no unconfessed sin that he won't forgive because he's a faithful God. And also because he's just. Because as we're going to see in just a few moments, God must forgive you because the penalty of your sin has already been paid. Christ has already uh, paid that penalty, and it would be unjust of God to now pour it out upon you. God shows his faithfulness and his justice every time he extends forgiveness to those who come and in faith re, uh, seek, to, seek to find it. Now, this is hard. This is hard for, for many of us to come before God and admit how great a sinner we are. It, it requires a, a sense of humility that, that many people don't have to be willing to acknowledge uh, how great a sinner we are and how much we need forgiveness. 
Charles Wesley uh, was once approached by a woman who, who said, uh, Pastor, pray for me. I am a great sinner. And Wesley looked at her and he said to her, Madam, I will pray for you because you are a great sinner. And she became angry and hysterical. What do you mean by that? I've never done anything really bad. Now, I want you to think with me for a moment. Someone comes up to you, and they look you in the eye, and they say to you, you are a great sinner. How are you going to respond? What's your first response? Is it to say, amen, I know, that's what God's told me too. Or is it to defend yourself and the choice of how you respond is a reflection of your heart? Are you living in the light or are you living in the darkness? God calls upon us to acknowledge we are great sinners, but we come and we confess our sin and we receive forgiveness from him in every way because of Jesus and that's the point that he makes in the last two verses of our text, in verses 1 and 2. We have a holy God. We are sinful people. What is our hope? It is always Jesus. It is always what he has come to do for us. Now, he writes in verse 1 of chapter 2, I'm writing this letter to you because I don't want you to sin. That, that's, that's the pastor's heart. I want you to live in obedience to God. But he's also a realist and knows that they will sin. And so in verses 1 and 2, he lays out the remedy for their ongoing sin problem and reminds them of two aspects of Jesus' ministry uh, to give them confidence and to give us assurance. Uh, confession, I want to be sure we understand this, our best confession, our best repentance, never merits forgiveness. We can pray and we can cry, and it never merits forgiveness from God. What Jesus does is what merits our forgiveness. Now notice, there's two, two terms that are used to describe the work of Jesus. In verse 1, uh, Jesus is our advocate. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. This word advocate occurs five times in the New Testament, and they're always written by John. And the advocate is uh, one who's called alongside to give someone help who is in need of it. Some, in John's Gospel, there are times it refers to the Holy Spirit. Here it's a reference to Jesus. Jesus is the sinner's Advocate, And, and the, the, the use of that term, uh, we ought to see a picture here of a courtroom. And it's the heavenly courtroom. And God is the judge. And sinners uh, are brought to his attention. Uh, and Jesus is there as the advocate, the lawyer, who will plead our case, who will do the work that's necessary and come alongside of us as we stand before that holy God. Jesus is our helper in our sin. He cleanses us from our sin. Uh, he is the one who forgives our sin. And he is the one who stands by us as sinners in the presence of God. But he's, he's more than that. Notice in verse 2, he is also the propitiation for our sins. That, uh, that word propitiation, yeah, in some of your Bibles it may say atoning sacrifice and I'll just briefly say I think that's a, a bad translation. Propitiation is a term that means a sacrifice that turns aside the wrath of God. And so the picture here is that Jesus is the one who took the wrath of God for sinners upon himself. And he turned that wrath away from his people so that they would not endure it and he endured it in our place. Jesus comes to us as sinful people and says, I'm your advocate, and I am the propitiation for your sins. Now, how does this work? As our advocate, Jesus does not go before his Father and say, oh, they really didn't do that. 
You, you need to understand there's circumstances that came up and they, they didn't do that sin or, or there were reasons they did it and uh, it's not a big deal. He doesn't advocate that way because we aren't innocent. He comes before his father and says they are guilty. They are terribly guilty. Jeff Landis is a great sinner and he committed sin again. But as our advocate, he says, but this one belongs to me. I propitiated for their sin. I suffered your wrath in their place so that no condemnation should come upon them. This one, Father, is one that you've given to me and forgive them because they belong to me and I paid for their sins. That's the work our advocate does. Based on the work that he does, has done, and the result is our Heavenly Father grants to us forgiveness. He does not condemn us. Neither does he overlook our sin, but looks to the blood of his Son that has covered our sin and taken that all away. Christianity is the only religion that starts with God as light and understands the implications of that about the seriousness of sin, but then gives the answer and the solution to that sin problem. And it's never something we do. It's always something Christ has already done. This is the message, John says. This is the gospel. What we've heard today is a summary of the gospel. This is the message, John says. I received this from Christ, and I'm passing it on to you now. This is the truth that God has revealed to us through his Son. God is perfectly holy, and there is no aspect of his being that's tainted by sin. And he demands from us complete perfection. Be holy as I am holy if you want to have fellowship with me. And we can't in ourselves because our sin is so very great. But he sent his son. And Jesus came to do everything for you that you needed in order to be forgiven and to have fellowship with God and to be restored in that fellowship. Your sin is far greater than you've ever imagined. But the grace of God is far greater than you ever hoped. This is the gospel. This is what we believe, and this is what we proclaim, because this alone is the good news. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, how thankful we are for the gospel. How thankful we are for the work of your Spirit that would come and give to us an understanding of our sin and give to us a desire to turn unto you and to find forgiveness and salvation in your Son. Father, if some of us today have not yet come to that realization, we pray that your Spirit would work and would use your word towards that end. Father, when we are struggling with our sin and we feel as if our sin is growing and growing and we, we, we become depressed and defeated, remind us of what Jesus has done. Remind us of your faithfulness in forgiving your people and give to us renewed assurance and renewed confidence, not in ourselves, but in Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.